Well, one of the very important topics in human genetics is the area of development and the order in which genes are turned on during development and the whole entire process of what's going on because this can lead to many of the human syndromes that we see one of the when we have issues with um, timing of, of the gene turn on um, or whether there's deletions or something that prevent uh, proper expression of gene or in fact overexpression of a gene so i thought i'd do a couple of lectures on uh, human development and talk a little bit about <coughs> uh, these three areas. Uh, we thought we'd talk about a little bit of early development, just to remind us of what early development looks like, a little bit about the fetal stages, just so we all have the same nomenclature and can speak about it. And then we'll talk a little bit about some genes. Now, uh, we could talk for the entire semester quite easily about the developmental stages, you know, embryogenesis, uh, through fetal development and all the regulatory controls that go on in here and talk about that. Uh, that's certainly a course that you might take some time uh, and is, a, is quite a, an interesting area, a very dynamic area uh, of study. We're going to just kind of highlight a few of these, give a general overview of some of the big points um, and really just talk about, okay, here's some examples. Here's what can happen uh, when you see the things go wrong uh, on, on other forms, okay? All right, so let's start with some early development, just to remind us of what's going on here. Okay, right, so here we have a, a model of a human female reproductive system. So we have the, at least one side of it, right? Remember, we're binarily uh, separate, so we have a, a right and left side. Uh, but you have an ovarian area, okay? And the ovaries are responsible for where the process of meiosis occurs. And as we know, we, we start out... Uh, life with a partial process of meiosis. And then this is arrested uh, until we go through uh, the removal of these from the ovaries. Now, just to kind of give you an, an idea of what we're talking about here, uh, as far as primary oocytes, so these are, these are cells that have gone through the first stage of mitosis. Uh, they're on the way to go to oogenesis ultimately. Uh, but they have gone through the first division, right? So you've done the Mendelian stuff that we like to talk about. You've done the segregation and assortment. You've pulled those cells apart. Usually one of those cells is going to become the mature oocyte. So it's a larger part of the cell. Mostly the other side is just a small DNA portion, right? It comes off and, and um, is, is lost for the most part. But we arrest those cells. Now, amazingly, um, in human females, uh, at about 20 weeks, uh, we'll talk more about where 20 weeks fits into this, but by that time, the ovaries have formed, uh, have uh, started to be uh, structures that exist. There's about 7 million cells, primary oocytes. So that's 7 million primary oocytes. So 7 million times you've had a mitotic event that goes on. Now, for the rest of your life, you're going to continue to reduce that number, okay? Uh, by parturition, by birth, uh, you have, these have been culled down and, and to about uh, one to two million. Now, this is generally by reabsorption uh, processes. It's not that they're being ovulated, okay, obviously, because they're not prepared for that, uh, but they're being reabsorbed or they're being turned into, to modified into other cells. Uh, for the next few years until you reach puberty, there's a continuation of loss of these. Okay? Uh, and by puberty, most human females, you know, whether this is age 12, 14, 16, whenever the, the puberty may be reached for an individual, uh, there are somewhere around 60 to 80,000 of these cells left, these primary oocytes. And then on about a monthly cycle, about 28 day, 24, 28 day cycle, one to two of these are matured and released uh, further from the ovary and with the potential for fertilization to occur. Okay, now, once they're released from the ovary, this is when the oocyte really goes through mitosis, uh, metaphase two. Uh, and so this, the final division and again, uh, release of the secondary uh, parts of the DNA, the other side of the sister chromatids, right? So you've already done the first part, that makes a primary oocyte. Now you're separating those out so that you can get a haploid cell. Uh, that, recur that occurs at about the time of ovulation uh, and so or shortly after ovulation. Okay. Uh, if sperm are present, 
right? Then you will have, of course, fertilization. And you could have, have a number of these sperm binding proteins that are involved that, that bring the sperm in. You may have seen, if you haven't, uh, you should go on the web somewhere and look at, at mammalian fertilization. And it's a massive process with the, the formation of the, the fertilization membrane, which occurs really very quickly. Part of that is to stop having these uh, secondary invasions by, by sperm, so that you only have really one sperm pulled in. And one of the interesting things that's been, that's been uh, discovered uh, in the last decade or so are things called zinc sparks. Uh, these were first really reported uh, to be associated with mammalian fertilization about uh, 2011. And then a very influential paper came out in 2016 talking about the, the, the importance of these sparks. Now, what this means is these sparks are due to the fact that there's release once the sperm has made contact with the ovum. And it's, it's zinc, right? And as you see it as a flash, okay? It's called a flash of life in some, some areas, but it's a, it's a, it's a release of zinc um, that has brought about because there's excess part of, in the system okay? and it's due to fertilization. And what was important about 2016, at least in, uh, in mouse models, right? We, we often use other mammal models. We don't, humans are part, but they were basically doing in vitro fertilization uh, of mouse ova and looking at the outcomes of that. And when they did, they, they reported that the stronger the spark, so there's two differences here, the stronger the spark, uh, the more probability that that, uh, that that now fertilized egg is actually going to be able to implant and, and go on to, to full development. So it was the strength of this. So it's a, it's a biomarker uh, for the strength of the potential for that ovum to implant and to fully mature. So it's actually now been incorporated into some reproductive strategies and things where, you know, where you have uh, in vitro fertilization events, you can watch the eggs and see. So it's a zinc spark. It's kind of cool. Anyway, there's, there's all sorts of things, sperm binding proteins. There's also proteins to stop sperm from binding, et cetera. Um, within a day or so, you start to have your first cleavage. So now we've moved away from meiosis, which is occurring back here, right, to mitosis. So we're just breaking the cells apart. We're going through the replication process and ending up with two daughter cells. By day two, you usually have somewhere in there between day one and day two. You have a two cell stage. Uh, then you start to, to continue to divide these cells. At first, they're just simply located close to each other and they're just dividing, right? Cells are becoming uh, four cell, eight cell, uh, more or less as they're called. It's just a, a collection of, of cells inside of here. Uh, then they become compacted. Um, and then by day five, you start to see things like blastocysts. Blastocysts is an opening area of the, of the developing embryo system where the cells collect uh, in a particular part of it. And then there's eventually by, usually by day eight or nine, the, the Fertilized egg has moved far enough down through the tract that it's, it's actually in the uterine system and can implant. We're in mammals, we implant in the uterine wall, uh, which will eventually allow production of the placenta. Uh, now, after that, okay, um, you go through a whole process. Here's the process of uh, fertilization, obviously. Okay, uh, We have cleavage, early cleavage, compaction, et cetera. Um, and then what's known as cavitation, which is really just forming their cell lines, cells that come the outside, and then you have an inner cell mass, and that inner cell mass continues to grow, and continues to grow, until ultimately between day eight and uh, seven and eight, uh, you'll potentially have implanting along the uterine wall. You'll have an increase in mass and have greater connections. At some point, you get uh, these bilaminar disc formations. The internal cells separate into what they're ultimately going to be. They're starting to differentiate. So at this point, you've got different uh, genes being turned on in the different regions uh, of these discs. And then you've got even greater. You've got eventually uh, by day you know, 13, 12, 13, you end up with a mesoderm formation. And okay? so you end up with even greater amounts of uh, material and more specialization. You get what's known as the, the primitive or primordial streak, which will become an important part because it's going to be the center uh, main part of the organism as it starts to develop and the cells will start to differentiate out of that streak. Once that mesoderm starts to spread, you get greater and greater parts. And then of course you get the, you have already have attachment by this point, right? And you get an umbilical cord, a more formalized umbilical cord so that you get this direct connection between the, the female 
the, the mother's uterine wall. And so that the, you can now be, uh, because energy has to be brought in, right? And uh, waste materials have to be taken out. So you're doing that by, at first, just really si fairly simple uh, transfusion of the material in and out between cells. And now you need a real transport system to start to develop. All right, so here's what we see uh, by about uh, the, the Carganigi has the stages are fairly classic uh, looking at embryonic stages, you kind of see. So if you take a you know, sonogram or if you have a mortices, uh, you can look and see at what stage where, about how far they are along. This is how one of the determinations is made. And you can see that by, you know, Stage 14, which is somewhere around 32 days, you've got very distinct eye buds forming. Uh, you've got uh, neural tissues, neural areas being formed. One of our big things is having neural areas. These continue along until you get to stay maybe stage 18, where you start to see limb buds. Both uh, they're they're somewhere in here in between those days, but certainly by stage 18, you've got well-defined limb buds. Uh, that have come out both for your, what will eventually be your hands and your feet. These, these continue to differentiate until eventually they start to separate and, and by, you know, forms. Now I've put a big red arrow in here because somewhere in uh, about seven weeks, um, around so 49 days, somewhere in this period in here, between stage 19 and 20 is when sex determination starts. Up until that point, uh, the, the embryonic is pretty much neutral, okay? There's really not a lot of uh, sex determination. It doesn't really care which way it's gonna go, if we can use that form. Uh, but by seven weeks, we start to see genes turn on uh, and activate that are gonna drive the rest of the path toward development of whether this embryo is gonna be, uh, and fetus is gonna be a male or a female. Um, and so we're going to talk about that next. Now, I just threw this little picture up here in the top because this staging is, can be very important. I was, did a study involved. I was doing the, the statistics of the study, not the, not the really the, um, I didn't do anything of the collection, but uh, you can, it's used for all sorts of things, right? Uh, one of the things that people do is when they hunt white-tailed deer, um, and they want to know in different parts of the country, they have different mating periods or different ruts, right? And so if you could measure uh, a fetus, uh, you can get an idea, a backtrack to where the, to where the ruts were. So uh, there was a big study done in South Carolina where they had extracted uh, fetuses at various stages. It was much felt like this. And uh, then they sat down and met, did a bunch of measurements. And eventually, uh, they asked us to do the statistics on it years ago. I was working in South Carolina, and for the, and um, we came up with this this numbers, this genetic, uh, excuse me, this um, multivariate relationship uh, regression problem, and, and said, and so they turned it into a ruler. So now when people can go out in the woods, if they happen to have a, a female a deer, have to shoot a female deer as pregnant, they can go back and trace it. So it's used in uh, management a lot around the country. It's one of those weird things, but it comes, basically, it's just a, the same thing as trying to do a Carnegie staging. Anyway, back to the important thing, sex determination, which occurs around seven weeks. Okay. Well, just as a as rule, I don't, obviously don't want you to try to memorize this or anything. I just wanted to have it in your notes. Uh, there are a lot of genes involved. Okay. Uh, the bipotent gonad, which means that it could go either way, male or females. There's a number of genes turned on for that. These are generally transcription factors. What that means is there are going to be genes that are turned on that are going to go back into the nucleus and turn on some other genes, maybe a whole suite of genes, as you might expect, as you're going through maturation of, of things as, as complicated as reproductive systems, you're going to have lots of genes turned on. There's a whole bunch of suite of genes over here that are in the testis determining pathway. So really developing maleness uh, requires a huge number of genes to be activated at various times. And importantly, they have to be activated at the, at the correct time, okay, and at the correct amount. We'll talk later about some uh, abnormalities that occur because, uh, yes, the genes turned on, but the genes overactivated and you end up with uh, issues. And then there's ovarian pathways, which you have more genes than this, but these are ones that are associated with some uh, well-known um, uh, syndromes. So this, this protein function tells you what these are. Again, most of these are transcription factors. Uh, some of them are receptors themselves. Some are other, other forms. You got a helicase in here. And what they've done is they've gone into mice 
and using mouse models and they've knocked these genes out. Okay, it's very, you can do that. You used to be able to do it. Uh, it was fairly complicated because you had to put in vectors and the vectors had to go find the right spots in the, in the early stages and knock it out. And we have knockout mice. We used to have knockout mice um, looking at neurological effects. We had uh, knockouts for uh, P62 sequestosome and looking at the effects of those. Then when you see when the genes turned off, what does it do, right? Well, so they've, that's what a null mouse is, what that means. So basically they've gone in and they've turned off this gene or this gene or this gene. You can now do that by CRISPR, so you can do a lot more effective. And they see the outcome, blockage in genital ridge development, sex reversal. Uh, so these were supposed to be mice that were going toward being males, but they ended up going toward being females. Um, no murine ducts production, sec, you know, lots of different things that go on. And then those related to some various human syndromes. Okay, not all of them have a human syndrome associated with them, but certainly some of these do. So, you know, using a mouse model, seeing the outcome and that, then coming back and say, oh, well, that looks like a particular type of problem that occurs in humans. Okay. So basically the idea from this slide is just that there's a lot of genes involved. Okay, and these aren't even all of them. These are just some. Uh, that, that have to do with sex determination. Okay. So here's a sort of a, a diagram of that. I said around seven weeks is when you have formed the genital ridge. That's when you have the start of the development of the gonads. And for about five weeks, um, you continue on a process of further defining and, and dividing the, the system into um, what it's going to be, where ultimately after, say, 10, 12, certainly in the 12-week range, um, you have what is the prototypical parts of the, the, uh, the internal genitalia of the female and the, and as well as the male, and then eventually the external genitalia. So things that are going to become the uterus and the oviduct and the cervix, the, the, the vagina, things by 10 weeks, uh, those have been, have been organized and started to form. And they, they happen because of these genes that turn on, okay? And there are really a couple of major gene systems here. One that was, is the uh, stry gene, SRY gene. This is one that's found on the, this is a sex determining chromosome uh, or gene found on the Y chromosome, right? And when it activates, its job is to turn on a whole suite of autosomal genes, well, Females don't have this because they don't have Ys, so they go through other pathways to produce the uh, ovarian tissues and ultimately uh, the, the other parts of the full vagina, the uterus, uh, oviducts, and all that, okay? So you get this, thing. once these genes turned on, they, they take these cells and they do things like produce testosterone. Testosterone leads to the, the development of the epididymis and the vas deferens and all the other parts. And eventually they turn on other genes which lead to you know, the external uh, morphologies. So the uh, part of this pathway though, just to show you is, is really, again, you have these genes, these STR, this SRY genes that are on the Y chromosome to make you male, okay? Uh, but where they're going to work and the effects they have is really on other places. And that's why this little diagram here. So you have this sort of system coming along. And if it's male, then you, you, you sort of function out of these, you know, uh, areas that are called bipotent gonads to say, yes, there's going to be male production that's going to be on there. And they turn on a number of, of other set of genes, one of which is, is the DMRT1 gene. The MRT1 gene is found on chromosome 9. Uh, way up at the top, there, it's actually a suite of genes. Okay? So there's a gene family, so it's not just one gene there. But these genes have specific zinc fingers. Zinc fingers are, uh, when you see a protein that has a zinc finger, uh, you pretty much know that its job is to go into the nucleus, right? It's going to go and be a transcriptional factor or it's going to do something else. And that's exactly what these do. Um, these genes go in and activate other proteins, other genes and develop proteins that lead to male specific programming. Without those, uh, the system then continues along a female specific programming. So even though sometimes you have this, this gene here, if you don't have the activation of the, of this autosomal ver areas of it, you still can do sex reversal and those sorts of things and end up with uh, either intersex individuals, individuals that are you know, in between or individuals that, that go ahead and move full, full uh, female specific programming. 
Um, we know this because uh, there's you know, been studying deletions in this region. So they're well defined. So you know that back when, you know, the chromosome stuff that we'll talk about where you can see uh, deletions because there's markers for that. Uh, we noticed that there are deletions here. And in, there have been mouse models where they found deletions and they end up a number of, of outcomes. Okay. All right. Well, that really covers what I wanted to say about early development and some fetal stages and, and one example of, of some of that. So now, I, the next lecture, I'd like to talk about genes and regulation. So obviously, I showed you a big picture, a big slide of all the genes that are involved in the production and moving you through sex determination. But obviously, there's a whole bunch of other developments. It's not all about the reproductive organs, right? We've got to make fingers and eyes and ears and noses and toes. So what's some of the processes involved there? That would be the next lecture that we have.